going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 is where we're going to be today. If you uh, don't have a Bible or a Bible app with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1035 and you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. And if you need a Bible, you don't have one, you want to read one, uh, then take one of these with you. It's our gift to you because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, it will change your life. Hey, while you're finding Luke chapter 12, let me just mention something I'm pretty excited about, but it's way, way, way in the distant future called January. And because uh, I know that everybody right now is locked into Christmas season right? And we know January is coming, but we really don't think about 2017 other than in theoretical terms. And, and so, uh, but we're trying to get you to, to plan some stuff because we're going to kick off 2017 doing the, a study called Purpose Driven Life. What on earth am I here for? And, and uh, we want everyone to be able to participate in this. And so uh, what we're doing is we're trying to give you a heads up, hey, block off seven weeks uh, there in January and February because seven weeks it can be transformative for your life and for your friends lives And, and so uh, we want to give you that heads up secondly uh, We want to challenge some of you to do more than just participate We want to challenge some of you to lead purpose-driven life groups uh, Seven-week commitment. Uh, see here's the reality. We don't have enough life groups for everybody and, uh, and there's a lot of you that uh, aren't connected to a life group, or maybe you're in a life group, and you really are qualified. You're, you're skilled. You're able to lead those life groups. And the, the, what we're asking you to do is in the bulletin, so check that out. But uh, if you're interested, then, then email us at, at lifegroups at calvaryLHC.com so that we can get you in that loop and get you ready, because you can have a huge impact on your friends, on your neighbors, on the people that, that actually like to hang out with you, or the people who just need a place to connect and we don't have a place. So uh, consider that seven-week commitment. We'd love to have you help us out. Uh, also, we just need some extra homes that are willing to host a purpose-driven life group. Again, seven weeks, and you say, hey, I don't want to lead it, but you can come and hang out at my place because God's blessed me with a house that can handle some people. And because we want as many people as possible to be able to experience the life-changing power of God. Well, one more thought, and, and there's some of you that have a social circle someplace where you've just got friends and they don't go to church or most of them don't go to church and you think, hey, they're not going to come to church with me, but they might come to your house and do a purpose-driven study, you know? So again, it's just a way that maybe you can uh, uh, carry the gospel to some people who, who are, are not really excited about coming to church yet, but uh, they might be open to talking about God's stuff. So just a thought. I'm really excited about it. It's going to be a cool study, and we would love everyone to participate. Hey, Luke chapter 12 is where we're hanging out today, and uh, while you're looking there, what is the number one accusation that unchurched people make about the church, that the church is full of? Oh, you guys have heard this. Okay, so how many of you have actually had that conversation with one of your unchurched friends where you said, hey, come to church with me, and they actually said, church is full of hypocrites. Who, who else has had that conversation? A lot of you have. Hey, the next time you have that conversation with one of your unchurched friends, surprise them. Go, you know what? You are absolutely right. And do you know that you're agreeing with Jesus? See what they say. Agreeing with Jesus. Uh, now, the truth is, every single organization, fraternity, group, whatever you call it, uh, on the face of the planet has hypocrites. How do you know that? Because we're sinners, and therefore every one of us has the capacity for hypocrisy. And, and so there are people who are less committed who say one thing and do another in every single group that's out there. And, and so I thought, since we're talking about hypocrisy and we're this warning that Jesus gives, that I would just go ahead and confess to you that I am a food hypocrite. Okay, I know I'm supposed to eat right. I'm pretty committed to eating right. I usually, you know, follow that 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 plan that I have, and, and I'm, I'm usually pretty good about healthy eating until, no, until I drive outside the city limits of Lake Havasu. <laughs> and, and there's something about passing that sign on the highway headed to Vegas or Phoenix, and, and I don't know if you guys have the same conversation in your car that we have in our car, but as soon as like we pass that sign, it's like, hey, so where do you want to eat when we get there? Right? Are you with me on that? And, and then it's like, hey, let's uh, eat something, and uh, then let's go get something to eat. Uh, and it, it's just like this constant uh, thing that happens to us. So I'm really good until then. So when your friends say, ah, church is full of hypocrites, just agree with them. And say, you know that Jesus said the same thing. Luke chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 1, very short passage that we're going to launch off of today. It says, in the meantime... 
When so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, Jesus began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Just a couple of background things. First of all, leaven is yeast. It's what we call yeast. Uh, we use it to make, you know, bread rise and be delicious, right? Because, I mean, who in the world wouldn't choose that nice plump dinner roll as opposed to like a flat cracker? You know, that whole unleavened stuff just isn't my flavor. Uh, but in the Bible, it represents influence, really a corrupting influence. Uh, in the Passover, when the, when the Isra uh, Israelites were led out of slavery in Egypt, they were told to get rid of all the unleavened bread, all the yeast out of their house. So they only had unleavened bread, and it was clean. It represents sinful influence that, if left unchecked, will corrupt everything that it touches. So leaven, not a good thing. So Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Who are these Pharisee guys? They were the religious elite. These were men who had dedicate their, dedicated their lives to living for God. I mean, they studied the, their Bible, the Old Testament, especially the law, the first five books of the Old Testament. And, and they read it, and they memorized it, and they learned it, and they dedicated their lives to following God as best they could. And Jesus warns about the corrupting influence of a group of religious leaders dedicated to God. Why? Why? Because Jesus said their influence led to hypocrisy. And Jesus can't stand hypocrisy. And in fact, you read the Gospels, which I strongly encourage you to do. You read Jesus, and the one thing that he fixates on, that he talks about over and over and over again in negative ways, is the hypocrisy, the legalism of the religious elite. And we know that Jesus detests hypocrisy because of this passage and the one that is right before it. In fact, I want us to look at Luke 11 a little bit, uh, beginning at verse 37, because Jesus was the worst dinner guest ever. See, everybody goes, ah, I think I'd like to go to dinner with Jesus. You might not after you read this. Because uh, uh, have you ever had a bad dinner guest? You ever had somebody that was unappreciative and kind of went off on stuff and made it really awkward and uncomfortable? You ever been that dinner guest? You know, I have, but I don't have time for that. So uh, Jesus was that guy. Jesus was the awkward, ruined the dinner guest. So pick up verse 37. Here's what it looks like. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. First mistake. So he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that Jesus did not first wash before dinner. Now, by the way, this is not a hygiene thing. It wasn't like he was, it was a ceremonial cleansing thing, a ritual to keep parts of the law that the Pharisees thought was important. And Jesus said to him, now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who, who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb, and you neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. And one of the lawyers answered him. Lawyers were not like legal experts like we think of lawyers. They were people who studied the law and were technicians about how to follow God's law. One of the lawyers <laughs> answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. <laughs> Duh. It's kind of like, uh, you, <laughs> I want to read between the lines because Jesus was like, I'm glad you didn't miss that. Uh, and Jesus said, Woe to you lawyers, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Skip down to verse 52. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. And as he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. And the next thing he says is, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is 
hypocrisy. Um, so what does this have to do with us? Um, it's real simple. Do you want to be a religious hypocrite? <laughs> Let me ask it again. Apparently it was <laughs> said the wrong way. Do you desire to be a religious hypocrite? Okay, good. Glad you answered that way. Otherwise, I have to change the sermon. Uh, see, we can't represent Jesus if we're a bunch of hypocrites. And, and we really don't want to be sitting on the other side of that dinner table when Jesus goes off on the people who are hypocrites. So, um, and honestly, I don't want to be the one who causes people not to come to church or Jesus because of my hypocrisy. So uh, I want to share the marks of hypocrisy. Um, I want to look at our lives and, and just kind of real quickly go through five things that may indicate hypocrisy in our lives using this passage we just read about the dinner rant of Jesus. And uh, by the way, your notes have four things. I'm going to mention five because I made a mistake. <laughs> and uh, imagine that. And so uh, we're, we're going to go through this. And here's what I want you to do. I just want you to listen to these and kind of evaluate my life before God. Are these present in my life? And, and kind of grade yourself on a on a one to five scale, how much of it's there. Okay, first mark of hypocrisy, style over substance. Style over substance. Uh, Jesus said, now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm washing my dishes, I'm more concerned about the inside than the outside. I don't want the gross stuff on the inside. I, I want it clean, and if the outside's clean, that's nice, but I'd much rather be eating out of clean dishes than nasty ones. A anybody with me there? Yeah, and, and Jesus said what, what's happened is you're concerned with appearances, you're worried about what other people think, and you want your external, your public life to look good, even if you're dying on the inside. It, you know, when we greet one another on Sunday mornings, uh, a lot of times we all kind of give the same answers. How are you doing? Fine. Good, great, yeah. And, and, uh, and it's easy to say, it's easy to answer, it's, it's quick. And yet how many times have we been driving to church and things were not so fine in the car with our loved ones? Because you're angry, you're upset, the kids are yelling, screaming, fighting, doing whatever, and you're yelling back and, and you're waving one way to people on the highway because they're driving the wrong way. And, uh, and, and, and you get here and you're like, all right, everybody, smile. Let's walk inside and be fine. It, it breaks our heart any time a family breaks apart. But it, it, when, you know, a lot of times we walk with families and try to offer some counsel and help, but what really crushes us is when a family uh, just surprises us because they looked like everything was great, and then one day they're just done. And we had asked along the way, and we always got the same answer, fine. If you're more concerned about the appearances than you are about the reality, then maybe hypocrisy is in your life. Second mark of hypocrisy, a focus on compliance, not compassion. Again, look at Jesus, verse 42. He says, Woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb, but neglect justice and the love of God. You ought to have done both of them is what he's saying. You know, see, they were such compliant religious people that even when they're a little herb garden, they would cut them up and they'd take 10% and give it to the temple because they wanted to keep the rules. And, and, and so they were complying with what they had to do in the religious stuff uh, instead of caring for people. And so if your spiritual life is all about checking the boxes instead of caring for people, then it might be an indication of hypocrisy. Uh, checking the boxes, by the way, if you're wondering what, what I'm talking about, I grew up going to Sunday school every single week, and they gave us envelopes in Sunday school, and we had to mark these little boxes on there. I'm present, I read my Bible, had a quiet time, I prayed, I'm giving money, yay. I checked all the boxes. I'm a good Christian because I checked the boxes. It's more than that. I mean, every one of those boxes is great. If you do them in your life, to have a quiet time, to pray, to read the Bible, to invite a friend, to come to church, that's all great. That is awesome. Jesus says, yay, but don't stop there. It's about compassion. It's about caring for the people. And if you can live your life checking the boxes spiritually and not giving uh, a, a care about your neighbors, then it may be evidence of hypocrisy. Third mark of hypocrisy, desires public recognition, honor, and titles. Do you hear Jesus Woe to you, for you are, uh, 
Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Best seat, the one of honor. You want the titles, you want the recognition. And, and the truth is, all of us love recognition. All of us love to hear, good job, you did great, thank you. But if that's what motivates you, then it might be a problem. If you need a title, if you need the applause, if you need the plaques, the certificates, it, it may be a sign of hypocrisy in your life. And, and this puts us in a tough place, like in, in my own life. I love the fact that Calvary is an amazing church and God is blessing and changing lives and growing us tremendously. And, and it brings with it recognition from um, ch other churches, other um, you know, religious organizations, and, and people are starting to say, hey, what's going on at Calvary? Why is God working so well? How can you do that in Lake Havasu? And, and we have those conversations, and I, and I praise God for the opportunity to influence other churches and kind of say, here's what we're doing, here's what's working, uh, here's what we fail at, but uh, here's, the, here's the stuff that you might be able to learn from. I love having that opportunity. On the flip side, the dark part in my heart, um, I love the recognition that goes with being pastor of a great church just reality it's there it's in our lives and so because i fight this temptation i notice if people insist on titles you have to call me doctor you have to call me pastor you have to call me reverend or if their name is plastered everywhere by the way for the record if you're wondering what to call me my mom calls me chad <laughs> and it works i've been answering to that my whole life uh, and if you have to choose a title to attach to that i like pastor because it best describes the calling on my life. But if you crave that recognition, uh, it's a sign of hypocrisy. Uh, the fourth one I'm going to mention isn't in your notes, so just write it in the, on the sides or add it in however you can. It's rules, rules, rules. Rules, rules, rules. Verse 46, he's talking to the lawyers now, the rule makers, and he says, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Uh, they're making rules. Hypocrisy loves rules, especially when the religious leaders get to make the rules, because we all like to make rules that we can keep and other people can't, because that makes us feel better about ourselves, superior and, and, uh, and so we have these rules. You can't do that. You have to do this. Sit down. Sh be quiet. Don't talk. Do what I say. You have to use this Bible. You have to pray this way. You need to cut your hair. You need to shave that beard off. You need to dress appropriately. Hey, did you ever wonder who decides what appropriate is? It, I figured this out thinking about it. It's usually some fashion-challenged, well-intentioned hypocrite who wants to decide what everybody else is wearing, which is why then if you're not one of those, you tend to judge the people who dress that way. So uh, I confess, I hate rules, especially stupid rules. And, uh, and here's my thing. Everything that God says, I'm not going to question it. I'm going to try to live it. It's kind of hard, but I'm going to try. I'm not going to question God's rules, but here's the thing. Everybody else's are up for discussion. Reality, that, that, that's how I approach life. But if you love rules, if you love enforcing rules, if you love being the one who keeps the rules and others don't, then that might be a sign of hypocrisy. Fifth sign of hypocrisy, you obscure the truth. Again, maybe the worst woe that Jesus mentions, verse 52. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. In other words, you've studied the Scriptures. You know how to find God. You know the path to God, and yet you don't go in, and you lock the door, you hide the key, and you get in the way of people who are trying to find God. You have the truth, but you're not sharing it. You're hiding it. And any time that we get to the place where somebody wants to add something to the gospel, we are obscuring the truth. If you're more interested in getting people to comply with your style than you are with getting them to meet Jesus, then it's obscuring the truth. And, he, and basically, boys, now this, anytime you, you have Jesus plus, you're obscuring the truth. If you accept Jesus and you have to change this and you have to do that, no, it is Jesus that changes our lives. So five marks of hypocrisy. How are you doing? On a scale of one to five, how many of those marks are evident in your life? See, if you're like me, then the voice of legalistic religion or hypocrisy, if you will, still rings in my ears and whispers in my mind. 
And I grew up with it, and I've learned from Jesus to be disgusted with it. We don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want to be hypocrites, so how do we protect our lives against hypocrisy? Let's talk about protecting against hypocrisy. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to following Jesus with your life, then I'm assuming that you want to actually not be a hypocrite. You want to follow Jesus. You want to do what he says and you want to represent him to the world. So we can't be hypocrites. What do we need to do? Three things. First of all, we got to have the truth. Jesus said, John chapter 8, if you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free free. Truth will set you free. Uh, in, in Galatians 5, the apostle Paul was echoing Jesus, and he said, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. Don't, don't submit yourselves again to a yoke of slavery. And he's talking about that legalistic hypocrisy. Don't, don't do it. So what's the truth? The truth is that everyone is a sinner and needs the grace of God. Every one of us is a sinner and needs the grace of God. The truth is we are not good people. We sin, we fail, we rebel, we choose destruction. And by the way, I'm not talking about past tense as in I was a sinner. No, it's present tense. And, and, and for me, what, what resonates in my life is I like the phrase, I am a scum-sucking pig sinner. If you haven't heard me use that, I, I need to use it more often, okay? I, I'm a scum-sucking pig sinner because it, it really captures the, the brokenness and, and the rebellion that's deep inside my heart. And I've had people who protested the negativity. Well, Pastor Chad, Jesus changed us. You should be more positive. You shouldn't talk about being a, a, a pig. That's a, offensive. And, and I had some people who said, you know, I just really get my feelings hurt when, when you use that phrase. And, and we don't have a safe space here at Calvary, so it's kind of like, um, sorry. So... The truth is, Jesus has changed us, okay? My life is different because of Jesus, but I still inhabit a body that is addicted to sin. I'm a sinner who Jesus has redeemed. I know that heaven is my home. I I'm going to eventually be there, and Jesus is going to make me new, but right now, I want to follow Jesus. I want to serve Jesus, but I still crave the mud. The truth is, the only hope we have is Jesus and the mercy that we get from his death and resurrection. That is it. And if we want to beat hypocrisy, we cannot get away from the truth. And, and, and the truth is, the reason that we encourage you to read this book is because when you pick it up and you use it as a mirror for your soul, it will reveal who you are and how God wants to change you. It will reveal who you are. And, and, and every time I open the pages of Scripture, God says, hey, stop doing this. And hey, I want, you, I want you to do this. I want you to focus on these people. I want you to open your eyes. And, and God teaches me how to follow him. And I need that truth in my life. It's the only way that we can beat hypocrisy. Is let the truth penetrate us because it drives us back to the feet of Jesus where we experience his grace. So, to protect against hypocrisy, truth. Secondly, transparency. I love um, this little passage that we read in, in chapter 12, but look at verse 2. This is a scary verse, I, and I really seriously mean this. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. <laughs> get this, verse 3 doesn't get any better. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Wow, that's a little bit intimidating, isn't it? God doesn't want us to hide, and he's not going to let us hide. Uh, from the very beginning, sin makes us want to hide. You guys familiar with the story in Genesis chapter 3? Adam and Eve are living in paradise. They've been made for each other. It's God's perfection. I mean, there's harmony. They get to hang out with the animals. I know some of you kind of dream of that and, and, uh, and everything. And they're just living there in paradise. One stinking rule, don't eat from that tree. And of course, what do they do? They eat from that tree. And then, do you know what they do next? They hide. They hide from God. It's not really effective to try and hide from God, but they do it anyway. They, they try and hide from God. 
And, and, and here's the thing, we're all sinners and we're all struggling and hypocrisy tempts us to hide our struggles and pretend that everything is fine. Oh, we're all good, we can, we can make it now. Freedom is found in confession. It's found in admitting your failures and receiving forgiveness and letting go of that guilt and shame that hypocrisy piles on us. Because hypocrisy says, I'm fine, and yet we know the truth in our hearts that we're not, and so we're lying and we're covering it up. And, and this, this whole transparency just rips that facade off and says, uh, I'm free because I, I, I'm not hiding anything. And, and, and I grew up in the, in the whole you know, Protestant idea of, hey, we're not the Catholics, so you ha- all you have to do is confess to God, and you don't have to confess to person. And I went, hey, when did, when did our tradition become unbiblical? Because James chapter 5 says, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So I grew up in the church where we confessed our sins to God and we hid them from everybody else, and it scared us to death that someone might find out who we really are, what we're really like, because hypocrisy tells us to hide our stuff and fear discovery, and hypocrisy tells us that people will judge us and reject us because we're sinners, which is probably true in religious environments. But it's not true in Jesus' crowds. It's not true at Calvary. We're not going to judge you. We're not afraid of your mistakes. We're not afraid of your past. We're not afraid of your struggles. You know why? Because we're just as messed up as you are. And we know that. And we're not pretending to be better. We're not pretending to be good. And, and, and all. We're, we're just pretending to follow. We're pretending. We're just committed to following Jesus. <sighs> we're just committed to following Jesus, and we're struggling along the way, even with our words. And so... And so here's the thing, because a lot of you are sitting there going, yeah, you're not as messed up as I am. Uh, okay, so here's the deal. Here's what, I want you to look around you, and it's going to be uncomfortable. Some of you hate when I do this. Uh, but I want you to look around you, especially to find somebody that you really don't know all that well. And I want you to look at them, and I want you to go, I am just as messed up as you are. <laughs> okay? Ready, set, go. Just it's real simple, because I am. I am just as messed up as you are. All right, some of you are enjoying this way too much. (laughs) If you want to have a messed up competition, just take them to lunch, then afterwards you guys can talk about it. Uh, Now, it's hypocrisy if you said, you are just as much messed up as they are. (laughs) See, that's the whole thing we're trying to get away from. But the reality is, we are, uh, we're sinners. And, and, And here at Calvary, we're just not worried about someone finding that out because we just shout it from the rooftops. So here's, here's where we want uh, to end up. Grace is wonderful to live in. So let's not celebrate how good we are. Let's celebrate how forgiven we are and how good God is. Finally, if you want to beat hypocrisy, you got to serve. Truth, transparency, and serving. Serving is putting love into action. You guys know that love is a verb, right? It's, it's an action. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. A new command I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's the first and great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Hypocrisy talks about love and then embraces an ethic of abstinence. Here's how you knew you were a good Christian when I was growing up. I don't smoke, drink, dance, or chew, or run with girls that do. (laughs) It, It was that whole list of what you didn't do. So I'm a good Christian by what I don't do? No, Jesus never said that. Jesus said you're gonna, you're, you're mine if you love people by what you do. It's an active ethic. It's not an ethic of abstinence. It, serving is an ethic of love, of justice and love that Jesus doesn't want us to neglect. So I serve because I love God, and I serve because I love people, and I want them to know God. I serve because God loved me and served me, and Jesus set that example, and I follow him. And one way 
to convince our community that Calvary is not a bunch of hypocrites is for us to walk out of these doors and serve our community. We talk a lot about 35 to 40,000 people in this town that are unchurched and, and that that's our mission field and we want to reach them. And the number one most effective way that we have to reach them is us being an army of servants representing Jesus in this community. And, and while you're thinking about this question, how do I serve God? I want you to watch this video about serving. Hi, my name is Jamie. I serve at Mom Life here at Calvary. My name is Shane. My name is Angela. And we are life group leaders here at Calvary. My name is Ken Mitchell. I've lived here in Lake Havasu City since 1969, and I've been serving with Calvary since 2003. Hi, my name is Brandon. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Kristen. We all serve in different areas of the family ministry here at Calvary. Hi, my name is Robert. I serve on the tech team here at Calvary. Hi, I'm Danielle Tamayo, and I serve weekly at the Early Childhood Wing at Calvary. I love to serve for what it represents for me. I strive to be a godly wife, a godly mother, and friend. When I serve, I feel that it really helps me build good quality characteristics. I feel it gives me an attitude of submission and thankfulness and just being joyful every day in the Lord. I'm excited about serving because I have a passion for technology and serving on the tech team allows me to use my talents to serve Christ. I enjoy serving because when you're helping somebody else, it, it, it makes you feel good. It's the right thing to do. And the fact that to be able to go out and help people, you know, and not ask for something in return because you get a great feeling doing it. I'm excited about serving because I get to share God's message. I like having a purpose and doing God's work. I'm excited to serve because serving my community and serving um, just to potentially make a difference in someone's life or the community is something that I would love to be a part of. And as Jesus served, he showed his love and he shared his love. And by serving, I can also show God's love and I can share it to others. I think that being a life group leader has impacted my life by just helping me grow every day and helping me just put on that spiritual armor at least once a week and go out into the world and just be a better a better person and a, a, a brighter light. Serving has brought our family closer to God. It's given us something that we can do together and it's given me a good example to set for my kids. I'm watching my boys grow in their faith. I'm watching the way that they deal with things differently by using prayer and going to the Bible. Serving has impacted my life by teaching me how to be humble, by putting others first, by not only focusing on me, but learning how to focus on others and put them before me. Serving at Calvary has impacted my life by allowing me to use my talents. I get to pass on the information that I'm learning on to future generations. I've learned grace, thankfulness, how to go above and beyond, how to reach out and step out of your comfort zone, and all in order to help other people. When I was younger, I was a little more selfish since I've been serving with Calvary. It's really kind of humbled me and just allowed me to kind of put myself at the back of the line. Uh, I just enjoy helping people out and it's just helped me to be a better person. Through serving, I found that I want to become a pastor because sharing God's message and uh, seeing kids come to God is an exhilarating feeling. Serving has impacted my life by before I started serving, I didn't really feel like I fit in, but when I started serving, it, it made me feel like I had a place. My whole family serves from different angles of the church, and now I've found my position within the church as well. So we are committed to serving our community. In fact, so much so that this weekend we are hosting a community serving fair. Um, we've got about a dozen of our partners from Lake Havasu City in this community, some religious, some secular, that have tables out front. If you've got the main doors and to your right, you'll see those tables set up. And we invited them to come here uh, because we said, hey, we've got a pool of people who want to serve our community, potential volunteers. 
And, and I just want to encourage you to stop by those tables on your way out. And, and if you've got time that uh, you want to give to God and, and make our community better, then, then check out those opportunities. That's not all of them in this community. It's not all of our partners, but it is tremendous ways that you can plug in and serve God. And some of you are going, how is it serving God by going and reading to students in a school or, or volunteering to help clean up something or, or whatever? And, and it's really simple. First of all, we represent Christ everywhere we go. And so you're going to really be invited to go into places and be someone who represents Christ and represents Calvary in that place, and you reflect the character of Jesus, and it's going to make a difference because at some point people are going to kind of know that, and you're going to have an opportunity to either invite them to church or share your hope or pray for them uh, or, or, or be a minister in that situation. That's our strategy for impacting this town. That's our strategy for sharing the gospel. Not everybody's going to come to church first. First of all, they need to meet some people who really represent Christ in a powerful way. Guys, that's you. God has called us to this, and as a church, we're committed to this. And so please stop by those tables and say, hey, you know what? I've got an hour a week I'd like to give, and, and see if there's a way that you can make a difference in the lives of people. Secondly, this is our community. We'd kind of like to make it better. I mean, we live here. Our families are here. Wouldn't we like to make this the best place in the world? What, what better way to love our neighbors than saying, hey, our community is better because we're part of it, and we're working to make it better. This is ministry. Representing Christ in Calvary and Lake Havasu City is how we're going to change our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while you're at it, you're going to smash the hold of hypocrisy in your life, and you're going to change the impressions of people who think that churches are full of hypocrites. So we told you the truth. We've invited you to be transparent. We challenged you to serve. Now the choice is yours. Jesus has warned us. Let's pray.